All right, we're back. We're talking about rationalization in Don Quixote, and uh, we just moved from the, the visor episode, uh, and we're going to go to the most famous one, uh, the episode of the windmills. This is the one where the expression tilting at windmills comes from. In this one, Joy of Joys is the first episode of Don Quixote and his loyal squire, Sancho Panza, whom we will talk about in much more detail when we do the comedy heavy Don Quixote. Why am I Sancho? Because <laughs> you're so fat. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, every time. <clears throat> so, oh, wait a minute. This isn't the windmills. Or is it? Talk amongst yourselves. The windmills. <laughs> Something like destiny has granted us great fortune, Sancho, for there are. <laughs> You're right, you're right. Giants. You're right, man. It starts with destiny, right? It's a great line. How do you remember that? So here's the line. Fortune is arranging... This is Don Quixote speaking already to Sancho. Fortune is arranging matters for us better than we could have shaped our desires ourselves. For look there, friend Sancho Panza, where 30 or more monstrous giants present themselves, all of whom I mean to engage in battle and slay. That's exactly what I said. (laughs) It's pretty much. That's exactly... (laughs) (laughs) And it is God's good service to sweep so evil a breed from off... Of the face of the earth. What giants? said Sancho Panza. Those thou seest there, answered his master, with the long arms, and some have them nearly two leagues long. Look, your worship, said Sancho. Remember, this is the first time he's out with this guy on his quest. What we see there are not giants, but windmills. And what seem to be their arms are the sails that turned by the wind make the millstone go. It is easy to see, replied Don Quixote that thou art not used to this business of adventures. Those are giants. And if thou art thou art afraid, away with thee out of this and betake thyself to prayer while I engage them in fierce and unequal combat. <laughs> unequal, because nobody can beat him. So saying, he gave the spur to his steed Rocinante, heedless of the cries his Sancho squire sent after him, warning him that most certainly they were windmills and not giants he was going to attack. He, however, was so positive they were giants that he neither heard the cries of Sancho nor perceived, near as he was, what they were, but made at them, shouting, Fly not, cowards and vile beans, for a single knight attacks you. A slight breeze at this moment sprang up and the great sails began to move, seeing which Don Quixote exclaimed, Though ye flourish more arms than the giant Briareus, ye have to reckon with me. So saying and commending himself with all his heart to his lady, Dulcinea, imploring her to support him in such a peril, with lance in rest and covered by his buckler, he charged at, at Rosinante's fullest gallop and fell upon the first mill that, fell, that stood in front of him. But as he drove his lance point into the sail, the wind whirled it round with such force that it shivered the lance to pieces, sweeping with it horse and rider who went rolling over, the, rolling over on the plain in a sorry condition. Sa- Sancho hastened to his assistance as soon as he could. God bless me, said Sancho. Did I not tell your worship to mind what you are about? For they were only windmills. And no one could have made any mistake about it, but one who had something of the same kind in his head. Hush, friend Sancho, replied Don Quixote, probably flat on his back. The fortunes of war, more than any other, are liable to frequent fluctuation. And listen to this uh, charming rationalization. And moreover, I think, and it is the truth, that that same free stone who carried off my study and books, that's an episode we'll return to, has turned these giants into mills in order to rob me of the glory of vanquishing them. Such is the enmity he bears me, but in the end his wicked arts will avail but little against my good sword. It's genius. Mm. Now, stop thinking, he, he, they're windmills. The narrator tells us, sometimes students ask, well, how do we know that Don Quixote isn't the one who's seen things correctly? Well, it's because the narrator tells us flatly over and over again, they're windmills, they're not giants. So Don Quixote sees giants, he fights windmills, gets knocked on his carcass. And at that point, the point where you would think that he would just admit defeat, because at that point he admits that they're windmills. Even there, he is most resilient, and he comes up with his rationalization which is essentially his lie. He says, well, what you don't get, dummy, Sancho, is that they were giants, but the sage in, in books of chivalry, there's always a wizard or a, you know, a necromancer or something, an illusionist, who is messing with the characters. That's very true of the story of Gawain and the Green Knight. 
And he says, what you don't realize is that they were giants, but he transformed them, them into windmills. Why? To rob me of the victory of defeating them. So hmm. here's my question for you, Anthony. Prove him wrong. Well, I'll get some refreshment. I can do this. Okay. So, um, uh, well, I mean, he's kind of got us in a box, right? <laughs> he's he got us in really a box. Do anything. Yeah, no, I'd have to get him to like abstract and like, you know, <laughs> you're just a book character. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> You'd have to go meta. The truth is you, you can't prove him wrong. That's mm -hmm. the, the glory of the rationalization. It is a skeptical argument. The way I look at philosophical, philosophical skepticism is that there is a philosopher who doesn't really care about truth or falsity or right or wrong. He just wants to poke fun. He just wants to get your goat. And so he challenges you on grounds that you can't really defend. And Don Quixote isn't doing it for that reason, but it's the same kind of, of argument. And this is part of the, the, the way in which Don Quixote becomes deeper and deeper. The rationalization gets really, really clever, and I think it gets really, really fun. It, it, it's the, the mindset that I think is very common nowadays, at least as you follow conspiracy theories, that seem just on the face of it just ridiculous. I was going to say flatly ridiculous, which reminds me of a joke about flat earthers that I heard on a Joe Rogan broadcast, but they are uh, able to take anything you throw at them. They can turn it around and make it at least seem plausible enough that silly people will fall for it. So um, I, I, I could actually tell that story about the Rogan broadcast, but do, do, you, uh, do you have some conspiracy theories? Do you have any pet theories that you believe in and spend hours online <laughs> researching? Uh, yeah, you, you still mine. Uh, Flat Earth, uh, that is so funny to me. Um, par partly because there's so many people that believe in it. I mean, for a long time, Shaquille O'Neal thought that the earth was flat. <laughs> right. I think he's since converted. I think, I think he, uh, Shaq. I, you know, being at that height, I feel like he would be able to see the curvature himself. <laughs> I was going to say. But yeah, I mean, a lot of flat earth people, you know, it, they believe that the, the earth is a disc and it's traveling upwards at the, um, the acceleration of gravity. And, uh, so that's how, that's, that's, how they, that's how they get gravity. Yeah. I've studied this in depth uh, and it's, uh, we're all in a giant elevator. How does the sun fit in? The sun, like, is it going up in the sun still? Like, is the sun going up with us? Like that? Um, yes. Um, there's obviously some holes there. Like, let's say you, you tried to travel, like, from, you know, one side of the earth to the other. Like, when you reach the end of the disc or something like that, the, the Columbus question, do you fall off or do you, you reach the Americas? Speaking of Flat Earth or the, the Rogan episode, it's number 1653, if you want to hear it. Anyway, by a guy named Andy Norman, who uh, talks about mind parasites, like a, a compromised mental immune system that he says is um, commonplace nowadays. And he thinks about conspiracy theorists quite a lot. He teaches at Carnegie Mellon. So he told a funny story uh, about, sorry, your, your people, your tribe, the flat earthers. And the idea is that one really diehard flat earther uh, dies uh, and he goes to heaven. And so he asks Scott, he says, now, look, you know, all my life, I believe that there is a conspiracy of those round earthers tell me the truth the earth is in fact flat is it not and so what does god say to him he says no I'm, look i'm sorry to break it to you the earth is round and the guy's response is well, this goes higher than i thought oh my god <laughs> i knew it was going man that's crazy so, andy yeah. norman carnegie mellon that's who i stole that from so uh, it's it's fun and it is the kind of uh, mindset that you, you probably have run into uh, in the course of your life, if not recently. Oh, I'm getting in the sun. Uh, I'm too much in the sun, said Hamlet. The divine um, light shines upon me. So, now I mentioned the, uh, <laughs> that was better, uh, Fresh Stone. After the first Sally, uh, Don Quixote comes home. And it turns out that his niece and his housekeeper and the village priests and the barber who care about him realize he's gone crazy and that he's, he's lost his wits and he's going off on these these escapades where, you know, he or somebody else could get hurt. And so while he's gone, they wall up his library. They just brick it over and keep all of those. I can't remember if they, I don't think they keep the books there. I think they throw the books out. I think they have like a little book burning, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just to, to, to do something happy. Anyway, so <laughs> Kyoto returns 
And he says, you know, where were all my books? Uh, and his niece responds, a magician who came on a cloud one night after you, after the day your worship left this, sorry about the mic, and dismounting from a serpent that he rode, entered the room. And what did, what he did there, I know not, but after a little while he made off, flying through the roof and left the house full of smoke. And when we went to see what he had done, we saw neither book nor room. But we remember very well, the housekeeper and I, that on leaving, the old villain said in a loud voice that for a private grudge he owed the owner of the books in the room, he had done mischief in that house that would be discovered by and by. He said, too, that his name was the sage Munyaton. This is a marvelous moment. I mean, for one, it seems like the opposite thing you would do if you're trying to cure this guy of his lunacy, which is to seem to give him evidence that his lunacy is not lunacy. But part of the fun of the story, they've gone through this careful story, walled up uh, his library, burned his books, or disposed of them in some other way, and even come up with a cover story that it was done by the sage Munyaton. So what does Don Quixote do? He goes with it. He says, actually, he must have said, Freestone. The housekeeper says, well, I, I don't know whether he called himself Freestone or Freetone. Uh, I only know that his name ended with Tone. And Don Quixote says, so it does. And he is a sage magician, a great enemy of mine, who has a spite against me because he knows by his arts and lore that in process of time, I am to engage in single combat with a knight whom he befriends and that I am to conquer, and he will be unable to prevent it. For this reason, he endeavors to do me all the ill turns that he can but I promise him it will be hard for him to oppose or avoid what is decreed by heaven. Mm. Marvelous kind of, you know, conspir conspiratorial mindset. Anything that's thrown at him, he has a way of um, reconfiguring it or adapting it so that it fits his worldview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it won't, like, in the previous, like, I think chapter four or something like that, he runs into the guy... Um, or like the farmer or something like that. And there's this boy uh, who uh, gets mistreated. Yeah, exactly. I was trying to think of the name. Um, and he complains to Don Quixote and he's, you know, Don Quixote, this is a perfect opportunity for him to be a knight, to be a savior. And so he tells the farmer to treat the boy right. Uh, but then um, the farmer uh, proclaiming himself to be a knight plays into the lie like the niece does. <laughs> and because that's the only way to play with Don Quixote. If you want to play the... Like, if, if you want to convince him of something, you have to play his game, right? Uh, and so, you know, he manipulates him and yeah. gets the boy screwed, uh, and Don Quixote goes along his way. I th I th tell me if I remember it correctly. Uh, I think that the way he does it is that I think the guy's name is John Haldudo, and the boy's name is Andres. And Andres complains, just like right. you said. Yeah. And John Haldudo, kind of half mocking Don Quixote to his face, says, well, I'm a knight, too, right? He says, on my honor, sir knight. Yeah. I promise to treat this boy well. And then yeah. Don Quixote says, ah, well, I know you will because it would go against your honor or go against your code, the chivalric <laughs> yeah. code, if you were to uh, to mistreat him. And, of course, Andres is screaming, no, 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 he's lying. It's a trick. <laughs> he's joking. He's not a knight. And Don Quixote rides off into the sunset. Yeah. Uh, and shortly after that, John Haldudo begins to mistreat uh, poor Andres again. Um, this is one of many episodes in which the characters that Don Quixote meets and tells uh, that he wants to right their wrong that actually, Sir Knight, you have wronged our right. So <laughs> he's not a knight. He is, uh, in a way, an anti-knight or a neg knight, a villain knight. But he doesn't mean to be. That's part of the charm. Probably mm -hmm. not so charming if you're getting whipped. Goodbye, your mask. <laughs> yeah. Now, let's get to the episode that you have been essentially beholding uh, throughout, which is the Helmets of Mambrino. You looking to take off your helmet? No, no, to, never. Please. To undone your helmet? Nope. Okay, so let's see. Pardon me. I have to search to find the very first instant of the helmet. Of oh, Mambrino. <laughs> <Dun -dun -dun. laughs> the Spanish riff. <laughs> Shortly afterward, Don Quixote perceived a man on horseback who wore on his head something that shone like gold. And the moment he saw him, he turned to Sancho and said, if I mistake not, there comes towards us one who wears on his head the helmet of Mambrino. <laughs> See, it's just... <laughs> Sancho says, mind what you say, your worship, and still yours has a better ring. I know. <laughs> and still more what you do, for I don't want any more fulling mills to, f to finish off fulling and knocking your senses out. 
from the old episode where uh, Don Quixote was uh, afraid and Sancho teased him. He says, how can I be mistaken in what I say, unbelieving traitor, returned Don Quixote? Tell me, seest thou not yonder knight coming towards us on a dappled gray steed who has upon his head a helmet of gold? Well, that is the helmet of Mambrino. After a few paragraphs when Sancho resists, uh, it says, oops, I keep hitting the microphone. The fact of the matter as regards the helmet, steed, and knight that Don Quixote saw was this. In that neighborhood, there were two villages, one of them so small that it had neither apothecary shop nor barber, which the other that was close to it had. So the barber of the larger served the smaller, and in it there was a sick man who required to be bled, and another man who wanted to be shaved. And on this errand the barber was going, carrying with him a brass basin. But as luck would have it, uh, as he was on the way, he was on the way, it began to rain. And not to spoil his hat, which probably was a new one. I love the way the narrator <laughs> surmises. Probably it was a new one. He could have just told us. He put the basin on his head, and being clean, it glittered at half a league's distance. The barber, who was without any expectation or appre uh, apprehension of it, saw this apparition, Don Quixote, coming down upon him. He had no other way of saving himself from the stroke of the lance but to let himself fall off his ass, his donkey. Although that does seem to be a recurrent joke. And no sooner had he touched the ground than he sprang up more nimbly than a deer and sped away across the plain faster than the wind. Now, the barber shows up in a later chapter. We will definitely come back to that when we talk about history and fiction and also uh, language versus truth. Sancho comes up laughing. Don Quixote says, what, are, what art thou laughing at, Sancho? I'm laughing, said Sancho, to think of the great head the pagan must have had who owned this helmet, for it looks exactly like a regular barber's basin. Don Quixote responds, dost thou know what I suspect, Sancho? That this wonderful piece of this enchanted helmet, you have to picture him looking at it, recognizing it, it does look just like a basin. I must have come into the hands of someone who was unable to recognize it or realize its value, and who, not knowing what he did and seeing it to be of the purest gold, must have melted down one half for the sake of what it might be worth, and of the other made this which is like a barber's basin, as thou sayest. But be it as it may, to me who recognize it, its trans transformation makes no difference, for I will set it to rights at the first village where there is a blacksmith, and in such style, that that helmet the god of smithies forged for the god of battles shall not surpass it or even come up to it. Thus we have the helmet of Mambrino. Out of respect for this episode, shall we take our helmets off or keep them yeah, off? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I do have a new found respect for Don Quixote because, you know, I mean... Ouch. Yeah. You went padding. I had a sock, if you could see the sock. Smart. All right. All right, done with the helmet of Mambrino. You notice that Anthony and I have not had haircuts since the pandemic began, <laughs> and I am talking about the Spanish flu. <laughs> so what we see here is that as the episodes go on, it seems to me that Don Quixote, uh, his, his rationalization it gets more and more refined. So let's take a look at uh, another example, or an example of this where he almost formalizes uh, what he's doing. He says, Understand with all thy five senses that everything I have done, am doing, or shall do is well founded on reason and in conformity with the rules of chivalry, for I understand them better than all the world that profess them. This, in a way, kind of uh, puts the quixotic logic into almost like a syllogism. He says, basically, if I am a knight, then everything else follows. Then that's all that you need to know. You grant him the, pre the premise, and he becomes unbeatable. If you can see that he's a knight, then you know what's, uh, what must follow from that. So there's this episode in which Don Quixote has sent uh, Sancho on an errand. We'll talk about it later, especially when we get into Dulcinea. Sancho, not wanting to go, has actually not gone. He's just gone and goofed off uh, for uh, a few hours, but it was a trip that should have taken days. And so um, when he comes back, Don Quixote again has to deal with uh, the contradiction between what he ordered his squire to do, which his squire must have done because, after all, squires obey their masters, <laughs> and what, in fact, uh, or in the fact that he has come back far too soon. So here's what he does, kind of like the Free Stone episode. It seems to me that thou must have come and gone uh, through the air, for thou hast taken but little more than three days to go to El Toboso and return, so it was longer than I remember, though it is more than thirty leagues from here to there, from which I am inclined to think that the sage magician who is my friend and watches over my interests 
in, in parenthesis it reads, for of necessity there is and must be one, or else I should not be a right knight errant. That this same, I say, must have helped thee to travel without thy knowledge. For some of these sages will catch up a knight errant sleeping in his bed, and without his knowing how or in what way it happened, he wakes up the next day more than a thousand leagues away. So you have to love the rationalization. He, in the middle of uh, a paragraph, in the middle of a thought, he says, I must have a sage. He works backwards from the fact a sage must have done this, and I must have one because I am a knight, and all knights have them. There's another passage that I don't think we need to, to read in full because I want to uh, f- uh, finish before it uh, gets too long, uh, is one in which Sancho uh, shows some of the same logic. In fact, I'll read just a little piece of it. Don Quixote has just been in a fight, and he, as he often does, uh, has uh, gotten uh, the worst of it. And he seems to have had a few teeth knocked out. And so he asks Sancho, uh, amusingly, grotesquely, to reach into his mouth uh, and count. He says, But reach me here thy hand, and feel with thy finger, and find out how many of my teeth and grinders are missing from this right side of the upper jaw, for it is there I feel the pain. Sancho put in his fingers, and feeling about, asked him, How many grinders used your worship to have on this side? Four, replied Don Quixote, besides the back tooth, all whole and quite sound. And then Sancho says, Mind what you are saying, senor. Do you remember that episode? What could be the possible logic? You have to imagine he's doing this, like, with his fingers in Don Quixote's mouth the whole time, right? Yeah. Um, do, you, do you understand the, uh, the joke? I mean, why does Sancho say, mind what you're thinking? I like to think he has three teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where, but, but I, I, yes. think, I think it's funny to imagine what Sancho is looking at. He's got to be looking at not that many teeth and, you know, mind what you were saying or something like that. You know, yeah. we could imagine a couple di- different scenarios, but we kind of get the picture that it's not that many. And it's. Yes. Uh, so you figured it out. Yes. Yeah. See, actually, you, you rounded up. It's two and a half. He has two and a half yeah. teeth there. But I just forgot he said three, it. Yeah. So well done. <laughs> but you see how, how the rationalization works. <laughs> yeah. Now, Sancho is essentially saying, look, you, you said that you had four, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, and Sancho says, wait a minute, are you sure you don't want to reduce that estimate? Why would, why would that make any sense? He's got as many teeth as he's got. That's all. It's not going to change how many teeth he has, depending on what he guesses uh, the, the number to be. Mm-hmm. So why does, it, why does Sancho want him to, to, to reduce his guess? It's, it's rationalization, right? It's essentially the expectations game. He doesn't want Don Quixote to get his hopes up and think that he's got four teeth when mm-hmm. really he's got two and a half. So that's the number, two and a half. That's not going to change. But mm-hmm. if he gets him to, to guess low, then maybe it, not, it might not be so disappointing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, the reason... I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I wasn't going to say anything. The, the reason that I, I like that episode so much is that what it points out is that you know, if maybe up until this episode, you've been thinking that you know Don Quixote is just a flat-out nutcase. He's constantly, constantly rationalizing and changing the world around uh, in a way that suits him. But I mean, how many of us do exactly the kind of thing that Sancho said there? How many people purposefully don't get our hopes up about something that's coming because we're afraid of being uh, disappointed uh, mm. when we find out the truth, right? And so, what do we do? Like Sancho, we lie to ourselves. And pretend that we're, our hopes aren't really that high because we're cowards, because we only want to fall a little bit. If we fall, we don't want to risk a great fall. So mm. in a way, it, it just shows you that Don Quixote is heroic. He's willing to risk it. He's willing to risk the fall uh, and uh, never backs down. Uh, and, well, most of the time falls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a couple more examples of rationalization, which just uh, give us a little bit more depth to them. And the first one, I think, is just fun. The second one shows how the rationalization becomes something more profound. Mm. So the first one is an episode shortly after this one uh, where Don Quixote has had his teeth literally knocked out. And so the joke is that his, his cheeks are kind of swollen, <laughs> or not swollen, but what's the word? They've kind, of, they've kind of flattened. They're kind of hanging because his teeth aren't there to support them through some kind of cartoonish violence. 
but um, I better get out of the sun. A group of priests who are transporting a corpse uh, to somewhere where it has to be buried. Uh, and Don Quixote uh, attacks them and he actually breaks the, uh, the, the leg of one of the priests. The priest is marveling at this you know, lunatic who has just broken his leg uh, and wants to know who he is. And so he calls out and Sancho answers. Sancho says, well, if you gentlemen want to know who was the hero that served them so, your worship may tell them that he is the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, otherwise called the Knight of the Rueful Countenance. That is the rueful, full of ru- sorrowful countenance. Don Quixote looks at him and he thinks to himself, that was a marvelous name. So as Ormsby translates it, Don Quixote asks, asks Sancho what had induced him to call him the Knight of the Rueful Countenance more then than at any other time. And Sancho says, well, I'll tell you. It was because I've been looking at you for some time by the light of the torch held by that unfortunate man. And verily, your worship has got, uh, has got of late the most ill-favored countenance I ever saw. It must be either owing to the fatigue of this combat or else to the want of teeth and grinders. Don Quixote can't stand the idea that Sancho thought of this cool name for him. And so he replies, It is not that, but because the sage whose duty it will be to write the history of my achievements must have thought it proper that I should take some distinctive name as all knights of yore did. And he gives a lot of examples and he says, And so I say, the, the sage aforesaid must have put it into your mouth and into your mind just now to call me the knight of the rueful countenance, as I intend to call myself from this day forward, and that the said name may fit me better, I mean, when the opportunity offers, to have a very rueful countenance painted on my shield. You have to love it. Try to disprove that. You have, suppose you have an idea, and I say, well, nice idea, you must think you're pretty smart. But it was actually a wizard who inserted that into your brain, your brain in between two neurons. That's where it came from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sancho's got to be like, oh, come on, dude. <laughs> I had <In> a moment. <laughs> Sancho. Yeah. Exactly. I Don Quixote <laughs> can't stand Sancho to have that good a moment. So he actually inserts the necromancer even into the very brain uh, of his loyal squire. Okay, so... I said before that what happens is that the rationalization, just when you think that it's you know just fun and games, just when you get loose to it, used to it, it seems to uh, go into greater depth. To me, that starts to happen in a particular chapter. I think it's chapter twenty-five, when Don Quixote is out in the wilderness and he decides he has to do something to imitate Amadis, the famous Amadis uh, of Gaul. It's a fun passage, and it tells you a lot about him. It's going to take us into our uh, finale. He says, I would have thee know, Sancho, that the famous Amadis of Gaul was one of the most perfect knights errant. I I am wrong to say he was one. He stood alone, the first, the only one, lord of all that were in the world of his time. I say, too, when a painter desires to become famous in his art, he endeavors to copy the originals of the rarest painters that he knows. And the same rule holds good for all the most important crafts and callings that serve to adorn a state. Thus must he who would be esteemed prudent and patient imitate Ulysses, in whose person and labors Homer presents to us a lively picture of prudence and patience. As Virgil, too, shows us in the person of Aeneas, the virtue of a pious son and the sagacity of a brave and skillful captain, not representing or describing them as they are, or excuse me, as they were, but as they ought to be so as to leave the example of their virtues to posterity. In the same way, Amadis was the pole star, day star, son of valiant and devoted knights, whom all, we who fight under the banner of love and chivalry, are bound to imitate. This then being so, I consider, friend Sancho, that the knight errant who shall imitate him most closely will come nearest to reaching the perfection of chivalry. So as it is easier for me to imitate him in this, that is, he says he goes, uh, um, he goes mad for having lost the love of his lady, who has betrayed him, he believes. Uh, so it is, it is easier for me to imitate him in this than in cleaving giants asunder, cutting off serpents' heads, slaying dragons, routing armies, destroying fleets, and breaking enchantments. And as this place is so well suited for a similar purpose, I must not allow the opportunity to escape where now, which now so conveniently offers me the opportunity. Sancho says, what are you smoking? What are you going to do? Don Quixote says, 
I mean to imitate Amadis here. I just told you, you're playing the victim of despair, the madman, and the maniac. And though I have no intention of imitating Roland or Rotolando, for he went by all these names, step by step, he's still talking about um, Amadis, step by step, and all the mad things he did, said and thought, I will make a rough copy to the best of my power of all that seems to me most essential. And perhaps I shall content myself with the simple imitation, imitation of Amadis, who, without giving way to any mischievous madness, but merely to tears and sorrow, gained as much fame as the most famous. So you have to uh, admire what he's up to so far. He says, I'm not going to go out and do all the great deeds he did. I'm just going to pretend that I'm heartbroken to the point of madness. So he's already, in a little way, cheating. Mm. Sancho says, It seems to me that the knights who behaved in this way had provocation and cause for those follies and penances. But what causes has your worship for going mad? What lady has rejected you? Or what evidence have you found to prove that the lady Dulcinea del Toboso has been trifling with some Moor or Christian? There's the point, replied Don Quixote. And that is the beauty of this business of mine. No thanks is due to a knight errant for going mad when he has cause. The thing is to turn crazy without any reason. And let the, my lady know, if I do this in the dry, what I would do in the wet. Right, coming back to like that uh, metaphor about like his brain drying up. <laughs> that's good. That's, I thought about that. Yeah. I thought about that, but that's perfect. The dry. Um, funny. The joke, of course, is he's saying like, Amadis went mad for a good reason, right? I'm going to outdo Amadis. I'm going to go mad for no reason. <laughs> and more than that, I want you to tell Dulcinea that. Because then she'll realize, wow, if he does this in the wet, or in the dry, what will he do when he's in the wet? In other words, if he does this when he doesn't have any good reason for it, what's he going to do when he does have good reason for it? One more passage, I think, from this. He says, Mad I am, and mad I must be, until thou returnest with the answer to the letter that I mean to send by thee to my lady Dulcinea. And if it be such as my constancy deserves, my insanity and penance will come to an end. And if it be to the opposite effect, I shall become mad in earnest. And being so, I shall suffer no more. So, here you have Don Quixote, a madman, in his madness, finding a kind of plateau, an oasis of sanity, and in that plateau of sanity, resolving to become mad. Yeah. So a madman <laughs> pretending or believing that he's sane, and then willfully uh, deciding to go mad. Easier to keep up the lie now. He's giving himself reason after reason. Yeah. What you see is that as uh, he, you say reason after reason, it's like he builds himself a ladder to greatness. I want to read another passage. Let's see, 4036. Make sure to subscribe to this channel <laughs> if you haven't already. Uh, time is ticking. So what Don Quixote tells Sancho in between is that what I have to do is what Amadis did. And fix I have the to, camera. Yeah, I have to fix the camera. I have to beat my head against rocks. Now, of course, after everything that uh, Sancho or that Don Quixote has just said, uh, essentially, he's going to fake being mad. Sancho thinks, well, look, why don't you just fake uh, hitting your head with the rocks? Sancho says, I should think, if indeed knocks on the head seem necessary to you, and this business cannot be done without them, you might be content, since the whole thing is feigned and counterfeit uh, and a joke. Oh. You might, be, con ouch. You might be content, I say, with giving them uh, to yourself in the water or against something soft like cotton. And leave it, leave it all to me, for I'll tell my lady that your worship knocked your head against a point of rock harder than any diamond. I thank thee for thy good intentions, <laughs> friend Sancho, answered Don Quixote. But I would have thee know that all these things I am doing here are not in joke, but very much in earnest. For anything else would be a transgression of the ordinances of chivalry, which forbid us to tell any lie, whatever, under the penalties due to apostasy. And to do one thing instead of another is just the same as lying. So my knocks on the head must be real, solid, and valid, without anything sophisticated or fanciful about them. This seems to me to take us again deeper philosophically, because what he is insisting on doing is not faking. Now, 
He was insisting on faking five minutes before, but don't let that bother you. He was insisting on faking being in love or faking being heartbroken. But you remember that then he said, go ahead and tell Dosanaya that I'm only faking. And then if it, I ever have good cause for it, well, then I'll do it real and I'll do it even worse than this. Mm. Here, Sancho says, why don't you just fake the blows? And Don Quixote says, no, I can't. That would be wrong. So what it seems to me he's doing here, and I don't know if it's conscious. I guess I doubt it. It seems to me what he's doing here is he is imitating the great Greek philosopher, or at least abiding by the idea of the great Greek philosopher, Aristotle. And so we're going all the way back to the 4th century Athens, uh, 4th century BC Athens. So here's something Aristotle says in the Nicomachean Ethics. He says, of all the things that come to us by nature, we first acquire the potentiality and later exhibit the activity. This is plain in the case of the senses, for it was not by often seeing or often hearing that we got these senses. But on the contrary, we had them before we used them and did not have to did not come to have them by using them, right? So we don't have to practice hearing or acquire sight. But the virtues we get by first exercising them. That is, or for example, men become builders by building and lyre players by playing the lyre. So too, we become just by doing just acts, temperate by doing temperate acts, brave by doing brave acts. This, then, is the case with virtues also. By doing the acts that we do in our transactions with other men, we become just or unjust. And by doing, by doing the acts that we do in the presence of danger and being habituated to feel fear or confidence, we become brave or cowardly. Thus, in one word, states of character arise out of like activities. It makes no small difference, then, when, whether we form habits of one kind or of another from our very youth. It makes a very great difference, or rather, all the difference. So virtue comes from habit. But he adds in one little detail. That seems almost obvious. You learn things by practicing them, right? But he goes further. He says, actions then are called just and temperate when they are as such as the just or the temperate man would do. But it is not the man who merely does these that is just and temperate. So doing the actions that by itself isn't enough. But the man who also does them as just and temperate men do them. It is well said then that it is by doing just acts that the just man is produced, and by doing temperate acts that the temperate man is produced. Without doing these, no one would have even a prospect of becoming good. By that, I think he means truly good. It's a fascinating philosophy to me. Now, had you heard of that before? Did Aristotle make any sense to you? Um, I haven't studied Aristotle a lot. I mean, I've heard uh, a couple quotes from you, uh, but um, yeah, no, that is that is fascinating. That you know, and I mean, that kind of rings the rings true with a lot of what people say nowadays. Is like, you know, you don't you don't decide to be a good person in one day. You uh, decide like to be it. a good person over. Or, like, better yet, like, you don't decide to be, you know, you can't just get strong in a day or something like that. You yeah. can't just, you know, learn a sport in a day or something like that and just be automatically good at it. You train, you train, you train, and you decide to be the person you want to be every day. Very good. Get there. Yeah, I like that. And it, it reminds me of a kind of uh, another cliche that people have used uh, and that students have mentioned when we I bring this up in class. They say, oh, I get it. What you're doing. What Don Quixote was doing is he's faking it until he makes it. But what Aristotle, I think, is saying is, is a little bit different. He says you can't be a good man just by doing what a good man does. In other words, it can't be just from the outside. You have to do a good thing in the way that a good man would do it. Mm, yeah. Now, I'm not exactly sure how you get from the fakery wanting to be a good man when you're not or wanting to be a knight when you're not. And then doing the good thing as a good man does, or doing the thing as a real knight does. But Don Quixote, it seems to me, uh, bridges that gap. And so I suppose you could say he fakes it till he makes it. But there's something about, I would say, like the purity of his heart that allows him to succeed. And one uh, detail, I don't think I made that clear about Amadis of Gaul, or about what he said about Amadis of Gaul, is that. He says, for example, look, Amadis went mad for a reason. The trick is to go mad for no reason. 
So here's Amadit. He goes mad because he's heartbroken. What does Don Quixote do? He goes there, he sees him, and then he raises him. He says, I'll go mad for no reason. Yeah. In that That's passage we uh, well, our passage we read before, he says, I want to bring back the golden age. I want to be a knight. You know, sometimes I think about gunpowder and I want to just call it off because this age is so detestable and I could get shot. But then he says, you know, knights in the old days, they were good. They did great things, but there was no gunpowder. Mm. I'm going to do it when there is gunpowder. I'm going to be even better than they are. Mm. Yeah. Like saying that they did something that was noble but possible. I'm going to do something that's impossible, something you can't do. And therefore, I will not just meet, say, Amadis of Gaul. I will raise him. I'll become greater, even though yeah. the, the greatest of all knights. Right. That's, that's a good one, said Sancho. <laughs> <laughs> it's nuts. It's got a kind of logic to it. It's very ambitious. It's very romantic. But here's the thing. With Don Quixote, the question is, does it work? He says, but heaven's will be done if I exceed in my attempt, I shall be all the more honored, as I have faced greater dangers than the knights errants of yore exposed themselves to. So you heard it from the man himself. Now, um, that was Amadis. Uh, well, that was Don Quixote talking about Amadis, right? right. Saying I'm yeah. even outdoing Amadis, and that's after mm. building Amadis up to the top, and then right. trying to top the yeah. top. Right? He's not an idol. Yeah, he's become a rival in this stage. Yes, stage. yes. Yeah. funny. Uh, uh, Don Quixote's uh, the one in the one moment so humble, and then in the next moment incredibly arrogant. All the while, not even being a real knight. So here's the question. Here's the big question of the book. And I should, I should warn you, we're going to jump all the way uh, to the end of uh, part two. So spoiler, if you don't want to know what happens at the end, this is the time to say goodbye. Nice to have you. We only have about five minutes left and we'll see you in podcast number three. Come back and finish watching this one after you read to the end of Don Quixote. But now you told me, Anthony, that you had not, you had not read the last part of Don Quixote yet. Right. But you had some idea of what was going to happen. Tell me, yeah. tell me what you what you thought happened because I thought that was right. an instructive contrast to what Cervantes actually wrote. Yeah, so I mean, I've read excerpts of Volume One, but I haven't read any of Volume Two. I know it exists, and I know a little bit of what it's about, but I couldn't tell you uh, anything besides like what I think happens at the end. So I'll, I'll give it a go. So it's what happens at the end is Sancho. Um, it, at this point, is like endeared in a way by what uh, Don Quixote uh, has has done, and he feels you know sympathy for him, and decides that you know what he's got to end his life on a good note. He has to get the W, and he's got to um, win in a duel. So he gets this guy um, to fake the duel, um, so he can uh, go off on a, a good note. Because I think at the very end of the story, he's on a very low note. But anyways, in the fake duel, Don Quixote still loses. The guy who was trying to fake the duel did a poor job, but Don Quixote still managed to lose. And um, yeah, after that, uh, Don Quixote is like injured. And this is where I forget things, but he, at the end of the story, Don Quixote dies. Don Quixote does die. It's very sad. It still, still breaks my heart. So... It seemed to me it was instructive for you to talk about uh, the way you had remembered it, the way you thought or you anticipated, namely that his friends would want Don Quixote to get a win. As I pointed out, it turns out that it's actually the opposite. It's kind of the same logic that they have when they wall up his, his den uh, to prevent him from getting to his books. There is a character, a student named Sanson Carrasco in the village. He's a new character in part two. And he thinks that he needs to snap Don Quixote out of his madness. <clears throat> what does he do? He dresses up as a knight, gives himself a name, calls himself the Knight of the White Moon, and appears in full armor on a good horse, not a lousy horse, and challenges Don Quixote to a duel. The idea is that he's going to challenge him uh, to a fight, he's going to defeat him, and then he's going to exact a promise of him to give up knight errantry. For his own good. It's like, it's like, it's essentially, it's the classic intervention. It just occurs to me, it's like the first intervention. Mm. Uh, and actually makes me think of what that critic Sontag said, that you could say it's the first novel about addiction. Mm. Susan, I'm sorry that I said that. I take it back. You were right. Mm. So here's Sansone, who uh, out of nowhere appears to Don Quixote and challenges him. 
he said in a loud voice, addressing himself to Don Quixote, illustrious knight, and never sufficiently extolled Don Quixote of La Mancha. I am the knight of the white moon, whose unheard of achievements will perhaps have recalled him to my memory. I come to do battle with thee and prove the might of my arm, of thy arm, uh, to the end that I make thee acknowledge and confess that my lady, let her be who she may, is incomparably fairer in, than thy Dulcinea del Toboso. Now, you have to love it. He says, my lady, whoever she is, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter. <laughs> He's using the same kind of logic as Don Quixote. Yeah. He's just inventing a lady that he can serve, and he doesn't even try to hide it. He goes on. If thou dost acknowledge this fairly and openly, thou shalt escape death and save me the trouble of inflicting it upon thee. If thou fightest and I vanquish thee, I demand no other satisfaction than that, laying aside arms and abstaining from going in quest of adventures, thou withdraw and betake thyself to thine own village for the space of a year, and live there without putting hand to sword, in peace and quiet and beneficial repose. Don Quixote says, I accept your challenge. They take their distance. They run at each other. Rosinante goes really slow. The other knight's <laughs> horse gallops, and he meets him at about three quarters <laughs> of the distance. And deliberately not hurting Don Quixote, he knocks him off of his horse. This is a young man, Don Quixote. He's an old man, you know, in his 50s, for God's sake. Knocks him down. And he, so then Ormsby picks up the, the story from them. The knight of the white moon sprang upon him at once, and placing the lance over his visor, said to him, You are vanquished, sir knight. Nay, dead, unless you admit the conditions of our defiance. So here you have Don Quixote with the lance at his neck, ready to be killed. He is in, strikes me, the same situation as Sir Gawain is at the end of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. He finally finds the Green Knight. The Green Knight says, so you're here to take your blow. And, Don, and Sir Gawain says, yes, I am. So he lays his head on a stump. And the Green Knight raises the axe and fakes. And what does Gawain do? Do you remember? Oh, like, he be, doesn't he beg him or something like that? Doesn't no, he, say, he doesn't like, beg. Not that bad. Oh, Physically, what does his body do? Oh, he flinches. He flinches, Funny. exactly. I don't remember they said that. How do they say that in the... Uh, well, it's I would remember in flinch. the translation that I've used. And it is um, you know old enough English that they do call it a translation because you can't really make heads or tails of it without that help. But he flinches, and the Green Knight teases him. And he says, give it another try. And he takes the, the axe, and he comes down hard on him, and he flinches again. He finally gives him a third try, and at that point, Gawain gets it right. He doesn't flinch. So what happens with Don Quixote? Ormsby, the translator, tells us. Don Quixote, bruised and stupefied, like lance at his neck, without raising his visor, said in a feeble, right, the vibes, remember, made out of paper mache, essentially, said in a weak, feeble voice, as if he were speaking out of a tomb. It's already a dead man. Quote, Dulcinea del Toboso is the fairest woman in the world, and I the most unfortunate knight on earth. It is not fitting that this truth should suffer by my feebleness. Drive home your lance, sir knight, and take my life, since you have taken away my honor. At that moment, Don Quixote lands to the throat. He outdoes even the great Gawain. For all I know, outdoes even the great Amadis. So what do we say about Don Quixote at that moment? What is his status? Bravest knight ever. <laughs> Goat. <laughs> MVP. At that moment, maybe the only true moment of knighthood in Don Quixote's life, he is a knight. He becomes yeah. a knight. He became a knight in the Aristotelian way by doing things that a knight would do, but more by doing them in a knightly way. Don Quixote is a knight, as are you, if you watch Joe's Great Books, as is Give me the spoon. Anthony Josephat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Give are it a you... good ring. I'll hold it for you. Yeah, hold on. Put it on my head. Wait. Oh. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Please join us for the next podcast of an event and a topic to be determined later. Podcast number three. Uh, we appreciate you coming to JGB and appreciate uh, my co-host for today, 
the, the great knight, the <laughs> knight of the cool hair, Anthony Jehoshaphat Sharkey. I should have looked at this before. Hey, I'm a turn signal. <laughs> <laughs>